Good morning. Good morning, good morning. The paper has been, I'm horrendously late. I'm horrendously late. I'm supposed to be here at quarter past eight and it's nearly 25 to nine. I don't know, it's because Mrs. W is in Canada and my routine is up the spout. It's completely, despite the fact that I thought I might be quicker because I don't have to interact with her. I'll get that fixed later. <laughs> it turns out that it was her that was keeping me on time. <laughs> Who'd have thought? <laughs> so, yeah, so what I do is I sort of get up, I check my messages, go down, make myself some porridge, have a cup of tea, decide I want some, some toast. You know, sardines on toast, boiled egg. <laughs> <laughs> Bacon and eggs, fry up, sausage and mash, usual breakfast, and uh, then uh, come up, check my phone again. Before you know it, I'm 15 minutes late. But I'm not going to drive like a lunatic. This is a nuisance, this sun. It's a lovely day in paradise. I've got to say that. I've got to say that. And uh, the sky is blue. But that does mean that because my route takes me north, I have uh, the sun on my right hand side and it makes for terrible videography. This is the problem. I much prefer a day when we've got low white cloud and you have a lovely soft even illumination of the subject. It tends to make me look at my best rather than this sort of real glaring whatever. But anyway, you don't, you don't, you don't do this to look at me, you do this to listen to me. That's the only content in this is the is the audio content is the uh, you know the actual video content is a complete waste of time other than a record of how how much more haggard I'm looking as the years go by but no I'm um, I've had a good old look through the cupboards and I reckon I can survive for the two weeks that Mrs W is going to be away and uh, like most dentists I do have a secondary life support system i.e. all the staff who I'm rather hoping would would keep me alive if it was necessary. So, well, at least they'll do things like wash my gown and stuff like that. So I don't think I can probably work out how the washing machine works. Well, I mean, obviously I know how a washing machine works. I mean, you know, I mean, anyone who can, you know, who's supposed to be able to work a Serec machine can uh, work a washing machine, but, um, it's just all these choices, aren't there? I mean, you used to have long cycle, short cycle, and spin. Now it's this temperature, that temperature, which I don't know what temperature bugs like to wash. The temperature that everyone recommends, the 40 degrees Celsius, that's body temperature. I would have thought that was lovely. If I was gonna grow bugs, I would, put them, I would grow them about 40 degrees Celsius. I don't understand why everybody's washing their clothes at 40 degrees Celsius. I know it's for energy saving, but surely the bug killing is, is it should come before the energy saving. What's the point of uh, saving a bit of energy if your bugs are thriving on your clothes? So, um, yeah, so I'm more of a 60 or 70 degree man myself on the basis that, you know, 70 is, 60 or 70 is the sort of temperature that you could just about put your hand in quickly and get it out again without, you know, getting it um, all mortally burnt, scalded. So, as usual, as usual, you know, I mean, oh, Michelangelo probably had all these problems, and Leonardo da Vinci, Mrs. da Vinci probably had to wash all these clothes and all that, and she would go away, you know, she would probably go to Barcelona for a couple of months and he'd have the same problem, wouldn't he? How to wash his smalls. great geniuses have had these problems. <laughs> ah, do you think you're a great genius? You should do. If you don't, why not? So, what else is going? What's going on in the world of dentistry? Oh. Sarah Hurley, the, the quivering chief dental officer under her desk, who's done, <laughs> said nothing, since she got the job, has um, has actually come up with a pronouncement, 
and it was more on the news than uh, to dentists. I don't think I've had a... Uh, did you still get the letter from the Chief Dental Officer? Do the... As the Department of Health comms department knock that sort of propagandist sheet on the head? Or do they still send it out? I don't... I haven't had anything. But then I don't have an NHS number and I think that, you know, the, the Department of Health doesn't really think... doesn't count you as a, as a real dentist if you don't do any NHS work. You're like, um, you know, they won't exempt us from the Care Quality Commission, but they won't send us the newsletters either. So, but to be honest, I don't mind, unless I, the private sector has to do with the Department of Health, probably the more, more it's going to thrive. But um, no, anyway, I uh, haven't heard a word, and then all of a sudden she's all over the news saying that um, she wants dentists to see more children. You know, she uh, thinks it's our duty to step up to the plate, and this is this is I think is a consequence of uh, Tony Kilcoyne's uh, Tony Kilcoyne's campaign, where he has got, got a letter published in the Daily Telegraph, signed by about 250 dentists. This was a few years ago. I think it was on was it on New Year's Day or Christmas Eve or something. Anyway, it's some some. Thing and it's turned into a tradition. I don't know whether that was because it was a slow news day or what. No, I'm not going to go. This is the junction of death. I oh, know this is tempts you. It tempts you to kill yourself. This junction, and I'm not going to. Yeah. So anyway, then the next year they did it again and got another 250 dentists or slightly more to sign it and. And it's all about how uh, you know we're letting down uh, the equal babies by um, ripping all their teeth out under general anaesthetic, um, which is true. I mean, it's a tragedy. I think it's a it's a tragedy that's ninety percent attributable to the parents and the crap, the Mars family, uh, but. Um, That's funny, actually, because the heir to the the uh, Betancourt died yesterday. The 95, 94 year old woman who uh, was the L'Oreal uh, owner, you know, major shareholder, the richest woman in the world. And so they printed a news from BBC. Oh Radio my Canada. God! I don't want traffic news. Um... Turn off! Turn off! 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 Let's see if that works. The, uh, yeah, so they printed a list of the richest women in the world, and Mars, the, the owner of the Mars, uh, the, the head of the Mars family, was one of them, and she's a woman, which is not particularly interesting in itself, but uh, what was interesting to me was that the Mars family actually exists, because I grew up eating Mars bars, and I've got the fillings to show for it, and, uh, and I never thought there was a Mr. and Mrs. Mars, <laughs> except on Mars, possibly, you know. Although possibly not, because there isn't a Mr. and Mrs. Earth on Earth, are there? Although possibly there is. So uh, anyway, too many possibilities. But uh, yeah, so apparently when the Mars family obviously is uh, very, very wealthy. And, uh, and possibly <laughs> wealthy enough to pay for all the damage that their products are doing. And in fact, if some obligation was placed upon them, on the, on the polluter pays principle to pay for the damage that their products are causing, there's a lot of alliteration in that sentence, then uh, their products will probably improve. <laughs> oh dear. But no, they are, uh, the, the, the food lobby in this country is terrible. And uh, I remember getting into an argument with a guy on LBC about uh, genetically engineered beef, cloned beef, and whether or not a beef burger made from a cow who was a clone would be safe to eat. And my, my attitude is, um, why bother trying, you know, why bother? And certainly, but my, my major point was, why trust the food industry to decide whether it's safe? Because, yeah, I'm slowing down, I've stopped, honestly. This safety system, it ought to be called the grandmother safety system. Drive with your grandmother, it should be said. There should be a switch on here that says grandmother on, grandmother off. <sighs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean these. I mean he's a relatively young bloke, so he's not. Um, you know, he probably doesn't remember that when the French tried to poison our wine. Excuse me a second. I just had to turn grandmother mode off there. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, the, ethene, the, the ethene, ethylene glycol, the French put ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze. You all recognise it from in the old days. It's what you used to put in your radiator. Now your garage does it. But in the old days, you used to buy ethylene glycol and stick it in the radiator. It's antifreeze. And then the French decided that it, uh, it's got a, quite a nice taste in small quantities. It makes the wine sort of taste a bit sweeter. So if the wine was a bit substandard, they used to add a bit of ethylene glycol to it to perk it up a bit which was discovered and they subsequently did uh, horrendous damage to the French wine industry and then um, the Chinese uh, uh, which is a state state production of course uh, were you know, they had uh, factories that produced baby milk and uh, the people who produced the baby milk had no uh, well busy in a lot of the usual places Right, I promise I'm going to do something about Stay that. Stay shut between five and four. That I've got three channels reporting traffic announcements to me. So I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to turn off traffic announcements and I'm going to turn off the fact that the radio comes on when I start up. But not today. No, I can't because I'm late. It's quarter two already. My patients are already there. They're already sitting there. I feel terrible. Well, I don't. It's just not the right way to start the day, is it? It's a shame. We do try and run on time. I'm literally about five minutes away, so I'm gonna, I shall swan in and just apologize for the delay. Tell them I was stuck behind a tractor. It's always a good one when you live rurally. Yeah, so these Chinese milk factories, they're producing baby milk and uh, someone uh, said, do you know where these baby milk, uh, they have to test it for protein. This is artificial baby milk, obviously, not real baby milk. And uh, uh, if there is a, no, anyway. Uh, so, um, yeah, so someone said, do you know these uh, detectors that detect the amount of protein in the baby milk, if you put powdered melamine in the in them they uh, they go off the top of the roof where the old detector goes right up it co it shows up as protein and um i'm nowhere near him and uh so some bright chinese spark decided to uh, uh grind up a bit of melamine which is in case you're wondering what melamine is it's the stuff they make worktops out of and countertops it's that really, really hard plastic that, uh, you know, they use it for chopping boards and stuff like that. Not so much now, but used to. And it can be printed up with all sorts of patterns like fake marble and fake wood and all this. Anyway, they, they grind this stuff up really, really fine and stick it in the baby milk. And sure enough, uh, they only have to put half the protein in because the melamine makes the uh, makes up the other uh, half on the fake reading on the scale and the only problem is that all these newborn babies have got uh, kidneys that won't uh, process this melamine this this indestructible knife proof cut proof plastic for some reason can't be digested and ends up in their kidneys and uh, and they all die so this is the food industry that he's trying to uh, uh, say that should determine whether or not cloned beef is safe. You know, the, the guys will feed you anything. They'll feed you anything. They'll feed you plastic and chemicals if they think you can get away with it. They already feed us fat and carbohydrate because protein and vitamins are too expensive to make. So, uh, if you're if you're sitting there listening to this eating a bag of quavers, I do apologise and please carry on. You know. Courtesy of, courtesy of the fast food industry. Please ignore this message. But um, as dentists, we're up against this. You know, we're, there's a there's a a food lobby 
that gives politicians money, which they need, because politicians need money to win campaigns so they can stay in Parliament and uh, carry on shagging their search assistants and generally uh, accumulating as much money and power as they can, which they're genetically, you know, required to do. Their genes require them to do this, the shagging as well as the accumulation of the, the wealth and the power. So uh, <clears throat> it's a mutually beneficial arrangement from their point of view. But it means that whenever we start complaining about the Miles family and saying that perhaps they ought to do a bit of a clean up, um, they're like, oh, well, no, everything in moderation, you know, everything in moderation, everything's fine, providing you do everything in moderation, you should be able to have candy floss, you know, you should be able to suck a boiled sweet. But it's not in moderation, you know. Moderation would be would be little to no sweet food in our diet. That would be, and that's that wouldn't even be moderation. I mean, moderation implies slightly less than than required or, or than usual, doesn't it? It doesn't imply uh, doesn't imply slightly more than necessary, even if more than necessary is a lot less than usual. So. You know, all these sweet counters by the side of the checkouts, all these these sweet aisles, whole sweet aisles in the uh, in the uh, in the supermarkets, and and it's all very well them saying, oh well, we've taken the sweets away from the tills. I think they have in supermarkets, but most other shops they haven't. Most other shops, most other shops, you're trying to buy something, you go into a shop and you want to buy, I don't know, anything, plastic bag or something, and then you have to reach across like a yard of sweets, don't you? To, to do, just to hand the money across. And uh, when you're out and about as a dentist, you do, you see what's going on, you know, you're in a shop and then the, the, the kid comes into the shop with the mum and what's the first thing? He says, Mum, can I have some sweets? You can see and hear this all the time. It's a bit like being a police officer and sort of driving at 70 miles an hour and seeing people constantly overtake you. You're not stupid. <laughs> you know, you know, you see this, you see what's going on. You know how the world works if you've got your eyes open. And the kid says, oh, Mum, can I have some sweets? And what does she say? Does she say no? No, darling, because you know that she's not going to say no, darling, because he wouldn't ask. If she previously, if she said no, darling, sweets give you holes in your teeth, he wouldn't ask. So he's asking because you know she's going to say yes, and that's why he's asked. Because previously, or usually, she says yes. And so she'll say, oh, yes, darling, but only one, but only one, you know, like that's, that's the level of parental responsibility. That's the level of uh, uh, restraint that the parents are exercising. Only one sweet every time we go into a sweet shop. And that's the, uh, that's the root cause of the decay in the kids' teeth and, and the cause of all these general anaesthetics. It's not, nothing to do with the dental profession. And it's a stupid, a stupid thing for the Chief Dental Officer to say every, if every dentist took on two more children a year the problem will be solved. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. And the problem of having an idiot as a chief dental officer is not going to get solved anytime soon either. Anyway, hope you're enjoying the old vids. Oh, 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 I forgot I've got a camera on the back. Any, uh, any complaints? write them down on a piece of paper, tear them up and stick them in the bin. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye.